transformation of bagging. Uh, I had the pleasure with me to have uh, uh, some uh, great speakers on the topic, and I look forward to hearing uh, their thoughts uh, on associated issues. Um, I will start with alphabetical order. We have Xavier Coleman, who is uh, CEO and co-founder of Ebedex. Yes, uh, and, but uh, he is also the co-founder of FinTech Belgium, and it will be nice to spend some time to uh, uh, describe and what you are doing there in FinTech uh, Belgium. Then we have Ezekiel uh, Safir, uh, the CEO of the Digital Bank of uh, Grupo Santander. Welcome, Ezekiel. Uh, we have uh, Peteris uh, Zilgalvis, uh, who is the head of unit for startups and innovation in the digital single market, uh, Victorate, DigiConnect. Startups is an important issue, so thanks for being here. And you are also the co-chair of the task force of the European Commission on FinTech. So um, it will be nice to spend some time to describe us what you are doing there and what are your priorities. Um, we also have uh, Cora van uh, Nuvenhausen, uh, member of the European Parliament and rapporteur on uh, FITEC report that uh, is written on by the European Parliament. Uh, due to some uh, last minute commitments, uh, she will join us uh, later. We will start the event with uh, the other speakers and uh, she will come uh, hopefully soon. Um, uh, so, um, we are talking about fintech uh, and we want to uh, to understand what will be the impact of fintech in the banking industry uh, the disruptive forces that it will have uh, how it can uh, um, incentivize innovations how it can play um, a significant role as uh, uh, europe to incentivize uh, uh, further development of european industry um, I'm not going to spend more time. You are here to hear the speakers, so we'll start with Xavier. Xavier, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I am the only one with uh, some slides, so it, it, it will be quick. Uh, there are only five or six slides just to, uh, to introduce uh, the, what FinTech Belgium um, uh, demands and the, the, the request of FinTech Belgium. So. I am the founder of uh, FinTech Belgium. It's a non-profit association, a Belgian one, uh, with uh, today roughly 40 members, 40 FinTechs. And um, the objective of uh, FinTech Belgium is to defend and to, uh, uh, to help uh, the FinTech in Belgium to develop more and uh, to have good interaction with regulators and politics. Um, yes, FinTechs are not... Uh, are very specific, especially in Belgium. We are, uh, we are smaller than banks, we are small companies. We try to make something disruptive in the, in the financial industry. Uh, often we address new markets, so uh, we don't focus on the, on, on, on the, not always on the big markets, but more on, on small markets, on new markets. And uh, a lot of fintechs are focused on a very single product or single service. So it's very different from banks, who provide a lot of different services and different products. Um, today, the, the relationships between fintechs and banks, especially in Belgium, uh, it's not for Europe, but at least for Belgium, we are much more in the cooperation mode than a, uh, a confrontation or a competition mode. Uh, a lot of fintechs are actually providers of banks with technology, with new solutions. Uh, sometimes there is mistrust between banks and fintechs, because banks, they don't always understand what uh, fintechs are doing and how they are doing. So uh, uh, it, could, it can be the, the future competition, so sometimes there is a mistrust. And what we see about the reaction of the banks, especially in Belgium, we see collaboration, but also we see sometimes banks trying to, to copy what the fintechs does or to create in-house what the fintech does. And some banks, they prefer to buy a fintech instead to uh, start from zero. Um, one big problem for, of the fintechs are the regulation, is the regulation. Why? Because uh, we need more proportionality. Uh, sometimes uh, the regulators, they ask the same, uh, the, the, they ask the same conditions for a fintech than for a bank or for a big player. And then it costs a lot for the fintech to develop something because the, the hurdles of the regulation doesn't mean that FinTech Belgium is not asking for zero 
regulation, huh? it's not the, the, the ID, but to have something in proportion and also to uh, help and to, to develop the, um, the all the electronic uh, relationships between citizens and governments and companies. For example, the, the signature, electronic signature, the electronic uh, ID are something very important. And we need also, also uh, and this is good for, uh, for Europe, it's uh, to have harmony on the regulations, to have the same regulation and the same way to, uh, uh, in, in the application of the regulation, because uh, a, a big problem of fintechs are today what we call the gold plating. So we have the European regulation and then on, uh, on the country, the, the regulations go further and asking more and then there is less uh, advantage to be in certain countries on, 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 on the others. Uh, we have also we need also funding, so um, uh, help to uh, to uh, tax incentive, for example, to help uh, funding on startup and scale-ups. And uh, I think also the infrastructure should be the same in every country. Uh, it's a detail, but uh, 4G in Brussels is a nightmare. Uh, and why it's a nightmare in Brussels? While it's not in Antwerp and it's in 30 kilometers from here. So this is also important to have the same infrastructure everywhere. And I think we need also to, uh, to develop the financial education of the people, of the citizens in Europe, and also uh, to develop more the tech, uh, the tech uh, industry, I mean the tech uh, university, uh, to, to have more uh, tech specialists in Europe. That's all, I think, yes. Thank you very much, Sergei, for this uh, concrete and, uh, uh, you know, to the point uh, uh, initial uh, talk. Um, just uh, about the regulation, that you mentioned uh, that um, there should be uh, some um, adaptations in order to facilitate uh, fintech firms. If I would ask you what are the top three priorities and, and stand in, in terms of regulatory reform that you would ask? For me, one of the most important is the proportion. Uh, I think the regulator has to measure the risk of the fintech. Uh, clearly, it's not a systemic, systemic risk, but I understand there are, there are risks, and so uh, we need regulation. But uh, I think the most important is proportion uh, related to the risk and also to allow uh, fintechs to, 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 to play or to, to make tests with new features, new services, and to have like uh, uh, what, what is called uh, a sandbox, where uh, a fintech can, can, can test new, uh, new services and, new, and new, uh, new, new products. And then if there is some success, I understand, and we understand as in FinTech Belgium, that we need regulation, but in proportion of the risk. Uh, thank you. Uh, you also mentioned that um, uh, the relationship between banks and uh, FinTech startups um, is uh, more cooperative, but there is some element of mistrust. Uh, could you elaborate through an example, for example, uh, for an example of this mistrust? Okay. Uh, if I take, if, if I take my fintech called uh, Edebex, so we are a marketplace where companies can set their receivables to have cash. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit like uh, factoring. And so we have, we have very good relationship with factoring services in, in Belgium. Uh, and are, uh, all, all the big banks, they have, uh, they have factoring. And so they want to cooperate with us because they see that we are not on the same market. So we, we don't address the same clients, but in parallel, they say, okay, but those guys could be the, the competition of tomorrow, so why to help them? So you have people in the bank saying, okay, we have to cooperate because it's an added value for their clients, and other people in the same bank say, no, 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 we don't want because Adebex could be the next uh, competitor. And so that's uh, the schizophrenic position sometimes in the banks. Thank you very much. Ezekiel, what do you think? I, I, overall, um, I have to say I could have used probably your slides, uh, very, good, very good point. And I think we are a little bit in the, in the same place. Uh, I think uh, the only thing I would probably replace a few words. So I think um, while well, you're asking for everything, eh? uh, we, we think banks in general want the same, just that it's not for fintechs, it's for the activity. So 
the, um, I think it's very, very important to understand that uh, I think the, the regulatory environment has to be written about the activity, which because the, the risk is linked to activity, everything is linked to activity and not the who's doing it. So uh, if it's a FinTech or it's a, a you know, um, ING, Santander, or BBA, I don't care. It's, uh, it's activity. And, and then you apply the proportionality, you apply the sandbox, everything you ask for I think is very important. I think for us in, in Europe, uh, we care for having a very competitive financial industry. Strong and competitive, uh, and, and for that we, we need innovation. I think fintechs are doing a great job there. Banks are as well uh, innovating. And I think we just need to have a level playing field and let them do. I, I also would agree with, uh, uh, with you on, on uh, Xavier on the, on the options there. I mean, uh, I've seen banks and we have been uh, flirting to buy this uh, startup or that one. I think uh, when uh, banks uh, buy a startup what, or they invest in a startup, what they do actually, they are closing the virtuous cycle of R&D and development in the bank industry in Europe. It's like bingo. So uh, you will have a lot of R&D. R&D is usually done a lot more, really well done by fintechs. So all this innovation R&D can be done in Europe uh, as we move forward. As far as investors, which are venture capitals, understand there is an exit. Otherwise, they wouldn't throw the money there. So we need to ex help the exit. And the exit is many times banks. So I think banks should be encouraged to participate with you guys, partner, and if they like it, buy. Uh, when they buy, usually they pay a nice premium that makes you, the founder, very happy. And I think the premium reflects what for us is speed and knowledge. So I'm also happy to pay the premium. It's good for Europe because that premium goes into speed and knowledge. The, um, the thing is that then I want to operate that startup. And if I'm subject to different legislation because I'm not a fintech, I'm a bank, I cannot operate. I cannot pay the CEO the way you pay. I cannot have the information the way you have. I cannot do the activities the way you have. Because you have this. So if we do a level playing field, meaning the, uh, the regulation that you're subject to is the same we are subject to, which is proportionality to everything, then we are all happy and we have a very dynamic European environment. And there's one, one thing you said, buying is one, the other one is uh, copying or, or copywriting, copy which uh, is a bit the rule of the game. You should have an advantage that is very sustainable so they cannot copy you very fast. If they copy you in the afternoon, then your idea was not that good. Uh, and then the collaboration, we uh, at Open Bank, I, I'm managing Open Bank, that is a digital bank uh, from Santander Group, we have about about not more than a million customers today, uh, all fully digital, it's only one branch. And uh, we have full API layer, so we have fully APIs already uh, for every single service API. The whole front of our bank is uh, in the cloud, in the public cloud, uh, done in a process with the joint supervisory team of the European uh, bank. Uh, a very long process, very fair process. We, didn't, we, we, we thought we were treated fairly. And uh, all of our information, because we have this cloud thing, we, have, we are using machine learning for everything that is um, uh, from um, risk algorithms for uh, loans, for UPLs, uh, for credit card issuing. We use it for AML, for money laundering. We use it for, and it's, it's really fantastic. Where do we have mistrust with, um, with fintechs when we collaborate? For us today, five of the services we are offering to our bank are using, people probably don't know, are fintechs connected to APIs. Bad news, American fintechs, London-based fintech, which in the short term would not be in this room, and Israeli fintechs are not in this room. European fintechs, so far we didn't find one that made it to the point to uh, connect. So we're very, we're very open to them. Mistrust, mistrust comes from two places. It comes from a, a cultural thing from some people that simply um, <coughs> are in denial. And we all have friends in denial in the banks, in the parliament, in the think tanks. It's like it's normal. This is like a, the, I, I think we are a very lucky or unlucky generation living a like a big transformation. And it's like we're here discussing the train. Should we have trains? But they bring crops from Ukraine to Europe. What do we do now with the local crop? So we stoop the trains and no trains. You know, a society, a country, and a region with a lot of trains is more is richer than a, without trains. Mobility of people, so I want trains. So we're very happy. The, the mistrust from some of us comes from the fact that if the FinTech takes, for example, all the username and passwords of my customers, like many aggregators do, the, the PFMs, the personal finance managers, all these uh, applications you download. People in Spain, for example, there's one with 300,000 people that put their password and username. If that is a FinTech that, because it's proportionality, FinTech and Sandbox and you name it, has funding for another year and a half, in case of a solution, 
There's no money from the customers. There's no risk. But who takes those passwords and where are going to be? And, and by the way, if they are very successful, where are they? In a server? In two servers? In the cloud? In which cloud? Who's going to? So um, I think it's, it's a mistrust comes from the fact that instead of using proper APIs to connect, an API is a very, very short line of code. It's a, it's a bunch of, uh, it's like a little program that says, when Xavier knocks the door, if he identifies himself properly, which is the computer and the thing, he gets this information, no more, this, which is the name, address, that's what he gets. That's an API for business card address. Very simple, writing an API is very cheap. You can do it fast, and if I give him how it's written, he can get his business card. While a scrapping is saying, Xavier, here you go, somewhere here, take it and take it home, and whenever you want, it's yours. So with scrapping, what, uh, what companies, not fintech companies, uh, by the way, scrapping is being done for the last 20 years. Uh, scrapping does is that they get your username, your password, they get into the bank account every time they want, as many times as they want. You probably accept it with a click, a bunch of conditions, so they can get all the information, and they are storing it somewhere I don't know where. So if I tell you what scrapping is, I think scrapping would be forbidden tomorrow because it's incredibly risky for everybody in the system. But for some reason, we think scrapping is cool because it's this thing about, a uh, romantic thing about uh, scrapping while you have APIs which are pretty straightforward, and if the law says you bank need to give this to everybody, I do it. I obey the law, I put an API and give him. So I don't think there is, the mistrust comes from the fact that legislation is evolving fast, but not fast enough, and we are worried about the customer information from my clients that I'm liable for, because I will, to be in the hands of a startup that probably has funding for another year and a half, and they don't have, you know the money you're investing in, in commercial stuff, so you don't have enough capital and money to do proper cybersecurity, to have proper backups and stuff. So uh, anything but mistrust at a personal level. I don't, I'm not worried like others are worried about you guys doing something wrong with information. I think you're very integral. So I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about crooks, not about you. So, uh, and I think now that uh, WannaCry attacked everybody, and you have seen the Russian government being cracked, which are the guys cracking everybody. So, uh, it's shown that we don't know who, but it's not that difficult to do. And they wanted money through bitcoins to liberate your computer. If they would want uh, passwords, they probably have them. And of course, you don't go to Santander, BBVA, ING, that are very strong. You go to startups, you just get it, and they, not even, they don't even know they got information. And uh, there is a website in the dark, it's called Dark Internet, I just forgot the name, where you go, you put your, um, your email address, just the address, and it tells you if it's on the market with a password. So my, uh, my email address is in the, in the black market with probably a password, and it says where it, where it comes from. Mine comes from LinkedIn, and it says from LinkedIn, from the bridge that was public, I think 2013, whatever. Because I did change my password, I know that whoever buys that has the email to send me spam information, or like advertising, but at least they cannot get to my stuff. Uh, it's very scary, so that's it took a lot of time. Sorry. No, no, thanks. Uh, very good. A lot of questions. Um, uh, first of all, on uh, these APIs, um, how can uh, incentivize uh, the adoption of this uh, to become a norm uh, by all the market players? Is it a matter of corporate responsibility? Is this a matter of the proper regulatory approach? Um, how we could um, reach this point that all of this is. Um, you know, we have more transparency over uh, information through APIs. So, so, so good question. Uh, Professor Xavier, you, you will agree that actually um, we all need regulation, but, but uh, we need a regulation that instead of making a, either digitization very difficult or unfair, one can do more than the other, uh, a, a, for the sake of the consumer in Europe, should really incentivize banks to go digital. And going digital today, I'm sure you are using the cloud, yeah, is uh, allowing, allowing no, incentivizing the industry to use the cloud is safer, cheaper, faster to use APIs. So then you should legislate very quickly in a very simple, fair way, leveling play field across EU markets, across industries, just activity. And at least when you transpose locally, as smart and as good as the Americans and the Chinese. Because also what we don't want to do is legislate like it would be a, um, an industry that is not global 
and then have American banks much more efficient than European banks. Because uh, usually you do have like a ENG of, uh, or some banks are, are, but they do have also an environment that you do have in some countries you don't have in others. Um, I mean, it's important to have more trust in order to motivate fa further investments in Europe. But one of the arguments of Xavier is, if we, we take the firm level approach, is that probably some big banks see uh, fintech startups as future competitors, and that create uh, some issues in the level of cooperation. Uh, what is your view on that? Um, bad news for them. I mean, uh, I think the, in a, in a social democracy like in Europe, we can do little about uh, management teams taking wrong decisions, as far as it's not putting my money at risk as a consumer, right? So if they decide to ignore and neglect his company, uh, that's called denial. And denial does not solve problems. Uh, I call this a tsunami. Tsunami has one characteristic, which is if you are told it's coming, you have to go. But you will see if you're in, in paradise there in the beach, you will see just nothing, just you know, water and still no even clouds. So um, it's very difficult to pack and go when you don't see anything. So um, banks, like many other industries, have been doing the same thing for many years, doing really well, making a lot of money. And you want to tell somebody, change. So, uh, but nobody has stayed to see the, the wave of the tsunami told the story. So I'm not going to stay. If somebody does it, you know, luckily there are banks. They're very well regulated, so it's OK. They will probably lose market share or become smaller. They, there is no role in the government. The role in the government is actually to make sure we have a very dynamic, strong financial industry in Europe. And for that, it needs to be a very, uh, um, an industry that can adopt these new technologies really quick. So we need to stop thinking about the cloud as a modern technology. It's a technology that's already mature, it's standard, it's being used for everything you guys do on your phones, telephone. It's all in the cloud. Just let them do it, regulate properly, put a series of bullets that cloud suppliers need to obey to. So I don't have to negotiate to Amazon, please let me get uh, the right to have an audit on your bloody servers. It's the law. So make a law that helps me there, and we will do the rest. And then for the future, beg that the cloud is not becoming what we think is going to become infrastructure, like electricity. And Europeans will have the electricity networks run by local companies and their cloud network run by American companies. That's a, an issue for Europe to decide how much they want to leave that piece of infrastructure, this, which will be crucial and strategic in the hands of foreigners. But that's a different question. Thank you very much. Let me turn to this side of the panel. Um, so the message is clear. What we need is uh, a strong financial industry. Uh, and uh, this is something that comes uh, from all the relevant players uh, of the industry. Uh, so, Petris, uh, could you elaborate how, what are the steps the Commission follows in order to achieve this goal? And before that, let me welcome you, uh, Cora. Thanks for being here, and uh, we are looking forward also for your thoughts. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with such other esteemed uh, speakers and also with, uh, I'm sure, a very esteemed and expert audience. I'll say a few words from the outset about the FinTech Task Force. I'm the co-chair. We set it up in November. It's very much with a pro-innovation approach. The idea is how to help make things happen, to make Europe the place for FinTech and for other relevant innovation. At the same time, we're not naive. We don't forget about consumer protection, for instance, and issues like financial stability. In relation to consumer protection, uh, digital, as we well know, is not a disinfectant that turns everything white. I mean, there are and will be fraud and criminal activities, so we have to make sure that the consumer protection that exists is covered. The public consultation has now closed. Um, you might want to ask me what was in it. I have to say that uh, right before the deadline, we had 60 submissions. And right at the deadline, we had uh, 165 more. So we had a look into the first ones. But uh, I assure you, we didn't work all weekend uh, on the other 165. But we're going to be going through them rapidly. Something that's an initial impression that I can share that it is positive from all the levels of players, from banks, startups, regulators, about the new technology, about FinTech. Let's make this happen. Again, that's a, a general comment. Speaking about a couple of the aspects that we're going to be following up on, which were also mentioned during the first interventions, regulatory and supervisory in innovation, 
how the regulator, while still protecting the consumer, financial stability, preventing regulatory arbitrage, can work to introduce the new technologies in Europe. We had a question on the regulatory sandboxes. Should there be a regulatory sandbox at the European level to help uh, fintechs go across border from the beginning? Let's see what the evidence, uh, what the information is on that that we got in from it. Something that's very interesting, it's also come to our attention, which is a little bit broader, and those of you who, who know me or see uh, my title, I'm coming from the digital single market side, is also the um, article of the Constitution that France has, 37.1, France Experimentation, which is a possibility to have something that is also like a sandbox cross-sectoral. So this is also an interesting approach for the future where you need to take data, internet of things, 3D printing, other innovations into account along with the fintech which might be the payments part of those services. Also we ask about cloud cybersecurity. Uh, we're looking for ways again that these new technologies can help our banking sector, also our fintechs become both the most secure for the consumer and at the same time better able to compete internationally and against new players coming in from the GAFA or from China, for instance. We ask about an innovation academy. This is bringing together the regulators, the regulated, uh, other industry experts, consumers organizations, for instance, to look at something like the cloud. What are the terms of service? How can they be better in a neutral space? I can say as a, a first reaction to the public consultation, we'll probably call it a financial technology laboratory, so it doesn't sound either too broad or too academic. We also ask about uh, distributed ledger technologies and blockchain, something which we're, we're positive about. With the assistance of the European Parliament, we're setting up a blockchain observatory and forum, which should be uh, announced by the end of this year, the, the, the public tender for that. And um, something that's also very interesting in this context is the European Parliament legislative opinion on the extension of FC on the investment plan where uh, the blockchain, IoT, and Internet of Things, and cybersecurity infrastructures are added as sectors. So it's also something that we're looking at in the context of a European blockchain initiative, which is asked about in the public <laughs> consultation, which could be something like an interoperability framework, or in the way that I just mentioned, also an engagement in making sure that we have these infrastructures at least available in Europe, and they could be linked to the European Cloud Initiative, the European Science Cloud, which goes beyond the scientific re, um, research institutes and is, how to say, answering a little bit the question that was raised there. I'm getting close to the end of my short presentation, but I will signal um, in relation to this, at the end of the presentation, I will rush away rapidly, and anyone who wants to talk to me is welcome to go with me or even to listen to me speak about Internet of Things, standards, and blockchain at Makerstown in, uh, in Otto World. But that's why I'll have to be, be a little bit rude. But this, this is linked. And then the last thing I say is that uh, ISO, the International Standardization Organization, has a working group, TC307, now on blockchain where we are represented as the European Commission with the so-called Liaison A, and they have a work stream on smart contracts where we're represented. So we're very happy to work with us as well, the community in Europe to make sure that our issues there, this is blockchain across all the sectors, are taken into account. And with that, uh, hopefully then uh, I can hand the chair, hand the floor back to the chair. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Uh, um, it is uh, nice to hear that uh, all the activities of the Commission that uh, goes to relevant direction. Um, if we go beyond that, if we go beyond the activities, to you from your experience, um, you talk quite often about FinTech. Uh, what are the top three issues, concerns, that uh, we should solve uh, in the short term time in the horizon? I mean, it's difficult to take just three out, but one is the regulatory 
work with um, the, uh, the authorities. And there, I mean, we hear very much that people like the sandbox approach or the sound box approach. I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly what the Netherlands or the Financial Conduct Authority, but this, how to say, work of the active regulator with the innovator, um, the ability to do some kind of live testing and the possibility to use the tool of proportionality. Uh, another issue I'll say, which was already brought up, the cybersecurity. Um, the financial institutions, I think, fully and have for a long time realized this. We also do see that some of the startups are not as aware. So part of our other activities, the Startups and Scale-Ups Initiative, is intended to bring together startups, mid-caps, and corporates. In this case, I mean with, uh, with the banks or other financial institutions. And one of the advantages can be also utilizing or learning more about, uh, how to say, the necessary cybersecurity to survive in today's world. And then finally, I will say, um, Continuing with a technology neutral approach, it's easy to say we do things a certain way now, now, and I'm one of the people who's uh, working on blockchain. Okay, we're gonna prepare everything to get ready for blockchain. No, we have to have both the legislation, the rules, and down to the policy level, which includes the funding, ready for all different types of new technology. Then when the biological computing or whatever maybe next comes, we don't have to say, let's do another fitness check and let's change everything that was in some way adapted to allow blockchain to be utilized for efficiency gains to be changed again. Uh, a clear list. Um, allow me a, a second question before I go to Cora. Um, let's go to the European Cloud Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, of course, uh, cloud is really important, especially for startups, because they are, allow them to use infrastructure that is not built in the premises, and that could be very costly. But okay. also, bigger firms use cloud because it's very useful computing power storage. Um, to, uh, why do we need a European initiative on that? Okay, I mean, I'll answer also, I mean, how to say also with a little bit the caveat that I'm not the cloud guy, but obviously we see this as one of the necessary steps to allow the startups and the fintechs as well as our banking industry to compete. I think I remember the statistic that 8% of the cloud services are provided by European providers. The rest are from other countries, which, I mean, we're an open free market as we know, but it does seem to raise cer certain issues, among others with where trading actually takes place. I mean, the trade may be on the Helsinki Exchange or the Copenhagen Exchange and so on, but because of the use of cloud, I mean, at least we've had this opinion expressed to us, it may actually be happening in another jurisdiction, which eventually could be worrying for market players. Other than that, I mean, I would say it's more competition. It's a question of having a choice, having a possibility to uh, have uh, a different price, different terms of services, and the more competitors there are, the merry and plus the merrier, and then plus it's uh, linked in more broad terms if we talk about the digital single market to the high performance computing initiative, which is not simply having the big computer in one of the several <coughs> places, but having the possibility to analyze the data, including the machine generated data, which looks to our free flow of data initiative. And so it's, a, how to say, a holistic vision of Europe being one of the major players in the world, probably, I wouldn't say the leader, but one of the players in the world that count in the digital uh, economy. Uh, thank you. And now we'll turn to Cora. Um, in my introduction, I mentioned that uh, you are the rapporteur for the FinTech report for the European Parliament. So I'm sure you have many thoughts to share with us. Um, probably. One question that you could treat also in your talk is um, uh, how closely you collaborate with uh, the, uh, the European Commission. I know with Peteris you meet quite often in panels. Uh, that, uh, and what do you think about uh, this um, uh, plan, uh, re plan uh, to move of the task force that Peteris described? Uh, well, good morning, uh, well, good, uh, good afternoon already. Uh, uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm sorry uh, to be late, but of course the work in Parliament also goes on. Um, 
what I'd like to stress first, because I see a lot of familiar faces here in the audience and I don't want to repeat everything that I've said in many other panels, but what I would like to stress is the need for speed. And that is exactly the reason why I took the initiative to draft a report in Parliament on FinTech, because I had a feeling that we were looking back all the time and not looking into the future. And if you look at all the new technologies, we have discussed them here, whether it's uh, the, the big data analysis, well, that sounds old fashioned already, but in fact it is not, because the, um, since we are combining it now with the Internet of Things, the number of data is growing exponentially. So we have a whole new uh, dimension to, to uh, the big data analysis. And of course, in combination with the artificial intelligence, with machine learning, uh, it gets, uh, uh, the impact is, is much, uh, much bigger. Um, so if we're talking, like you said, huh, should, should we focus uh, on, uh, is it a threat, uh, competitors of the future? Um, in my view, uh, you are at the table or on the menu, and there is no other option. Uh, because uh, all the new technologies have so many opportunities, so many uh, good things to offer to uh, individual consumers, but also to all businesses. Uh, it can lower costs, <laughs> at, at, at higher speed, uh, more choice, more convenience, more transparency, better risk management. The list is endless of the possibilities, and especially if you if you combine them. So uh, all these advantages are very attractive to, uh, to, to society. So uh, if you do not provide uh, the service, uh, somebody else will. And the rest of the world is investing very heavily. Uh, and we should be aware that we do not take too much time. So um, I, I like the, uh, if, if we're talking about speed, uh, I enjoy the Formula One sports. I don't know how many of you <laughs> uh, also do that, but my fellow countryman, uh, Max Verstappen, he's a very promising uh, young driver, um, but he's not in the best team. So he is a potential world champion. I think we can be that in Europe as well. But do we have the right team? Do we have the right uh, uh, preconditions here? I don't think so. Uh, and um, uh, we need um, legislation that is innovation friendly, technology neutral. Uh, like you said, we, uh, I introduced the principle of same services, same risks, same rules. Uh, so we have to uh, try to at least have as much as a, a level playing field as we can, uh, because legislative processes are, uh, are slow. But um, so in the meantime, um, we have to uh, make sure that we have uh, enough opportunities for experiments. I avoided the word sandbox uh, in my report, and I did that on purpose because I don't want to give the impression that it would be possible to copy-paste what the FCA in London has been doing because there's the critical mass of, of the financial sector is different, uh, different market structures. You cannot compare it, but you have to make sure that any initiative in, in any of our countries uh, with a potential uh, can grow. So I agree with you that it should not be about um, waivers of legislation or regulation lights, um, but you need a mental shift uh, uh, from uh, not ticking the box to you uh, or fit uh, to all the, the 86 or how many criteria you have, uh, but think uh, of the, the regu um, supervisor should be looking over your shoulder. Are there also different ways to be compliant? Um, because I also agree we have to uh, protect consumers and we want to avoid a new uh, systemic risk. Um, and I think we have to um, be aware that um, in the traditional financial sector in Europe, um, we are not only not having the right uh, regulatory environment, you also suffer from a legacy. And when I say that, most people think about the incrementally grown I old IT systems. That's a big part of our legacy. Uh, but it's also uh, a big workforce that is not really uh, capable of uh, working in, in, in the new uh, so we have a, a big challenge uh, on, on our skills. Um, and 
if you combine that with, well, I, I like to call it really a war on talent, uh, because it's a worldwide war on, on talent. Um, and it's not just in the uh, financial sector, because the, um, the, 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 the nerds, the geeks, one of my sons is, is one of them uh, that really know how to write and, and read algorithms. Uh, they are wanted in every business because it's, it's not just the financial sector. It's the digitization of industry is everywhere. There is not a single uh, part of our economy that is not uh, impacted by it. And they all want the same people. Uh, so we have to make sure that we address the future uh, in our education programs, and we have to help people uh, to, uh, to, to, to get fit um, uh, for that. And um, there was another point I wanted to make. Um, that is, we also have a legacy as a consequence of the financial crisis. People do not like us if you're working in the financial sector. Um, people were not really uh, happy uh, to, at a birthday party to tell that they are a banker anymore uh, because uh, people immediately uh, start talking about uh, the, all the public money uh, that had to be invested to we, uh, to, uh, to help the banks uh, recover. Um, and trust is lost very quick, uh, but it's very difficult to get it back. Uh, and then if you're talking about a level playing field, I think the, the, uh, the competition is not so much uh, the, the young startup uh, out on an attic somewhere. It's the big techs. Uh, that uh, have uh, high potential uh, to invest. And the strange or funny thing is that they still have uh, the prerogative of uh, being trusted. Uh, I asked it a lot of times before, but I ask it here as well. How many of you have an Uber app on their phone? Uh, yep. Do you know that Uber and many, many other apps, if you give your consent, uh, have, uh, well, they basically know everything and can use everything that's on your phone. For example, how, whether your battery is low or not. And why is that interesting, whether your battery is low or not? Because people with a low battery uh, are uh, usually uh, willing to pay immediately any price <laughs> to solve their problem, whether it's an Uber or, or anything else. So that's just a, a small example of what we all do. Uh, any product coming from China, a physical product, uh, we have all kinds of prescriptions and it's uh, tested here and there and all kinds of regulations and any app especially the, the free apps, eh? the, the seven minutes workout and all the things that we all like to get for free. Um, it's not for free. Uh, you sell your whole, uh, uh, basically everything that's on your, on your phone. We have to uh, create more awareness of that. Uh, and that is, that is in a way also causing an unlevel playing field because people, I think it's strange that banks cannot use the information that they have the accounts of people, uh, but they can uh, use it if they buy the same uh, data from Google or any other. Uh, uh, that is not uh, what, what I had in mind uh, uh, when we're talking about the level playing. We have been discussing uh, uh, the capital requirements for banks on, on software. Uh, in the U.S., you do not have to. Uh, I always think about it when I see Antonio sitting. <laughs> so, uh, you, uh, American banks do not have to deduct it from their core tier one capital, and European banks do. And if you're looking at the equivalence decisions of the Commission, maybe you can talk to your colleagues about it. I'm still waiting for an answer uh, from the Commission. Um, uh, you think it's important or not, but you cannot say, oh, in equivalence, it's not so important for American banks, so they are allowed to, to have different rules on that, and, and we are sort of punishing our European banks. It's many uh, more examples, but uh, well, you know a politician, you push a button and it never stops, so <laughs> I'll stop here. No, no, please. It's, uh, you introduced some very interesting dimensions, and uh, yeah, it, it's true that uh, the level of playing field is... Uh, can uh, touch many more issues uh, than uh, um, with a restrictive first um, uh, thought we can uh, we can uh, think. Um, uh, so um, 
you mentioned that um, competition uh, is not something that we have so much, uh, startups are not so much included in this competitive environment. Competition is uh, among bigger uh, players. How can further include them and induce them to participate uh, in uh, this competitive framework? Well, I think that is improving very rapidly. We are uh, in the past few years focusing on startups more and more, and also incumbents are more open to, to startups uh, in all kinds of constructions, um, uh, all kinds of arrangements. Um, so I think uh, the problem is not so much uh, the inclusion of uh, startups, but how can we move on to the scale-ups? Um, because then we are we still suffering from a lack of venture capital in uh, in, in Europe. Uh, we, we do not uh, still have a, a found a good ways to to combine our um, successful uh, startups with the right venture capitalists because they are all uh, specialized. Um, so I think it's it's more that we have to make sure that we. Um, want to act on a global level. When uh, we were in, uh, uh, I saw Pilar sitting there, but now she's disappeared, but we were together in, in Silicon Valley. Um, and um, what they told us there is that, well, uh, you lost the war on software in Europe. No? Most uh, important companies are in, in the US, uh, not in, in Europe. And if you uh, keep on uh, acting like this, you will lose the war on artificial intelligence as well. And that is not uh, a hollow phrase. Uh, I think we really have to um, make sure that that, we, that and that's when I get back to where I started with the need for speed, um, because this is all uh, developing so fast uh, that that we really have to see what what is necessary. Where are uh, where is our regulation handling things? It's maybe a small thing like the investment in software. If, if you want banks to be innovative, it's all about investing in software. So you have to have the right in, in, in incentives in place. And it is, um, you have to be open to all new developments. Too much of the discussion is focused on payments, in my view. Uh, you mentioned blockchain. Um, I still think that there's not enough uh, um, experiments on, on blockchain, whether it's on reporting or on, um, on, on all kinds of uh, initiatives. Um, maybe I can ask again, how many of you own any cryptocurrency? See, that's, that's the problem. You should all try to experiment and buy at least the equivalent of 10 euros of, and buy Bitcoin or Ether, I don't care. Uh, but as soon as you do that, uh, you learn what the possibilities are. And uh, we have to do that throughout the, throughout the sector. If you do that, you see immediately a big problem that um, uh, Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies, they are no real currencies, they are commodities. And why is that interesting? Because there is no VAT on uh, uh, these uh, currencies. So. And, and you can see uh, when you have a wallet, you can see where you can pay with bitcoins. It's growing exponentially. Uh, and you will find out that it's the cafeteria or the small uh, furniture, furniture uh, around the corner. Maybe it has something to do with the VAT. Why do I get adv uh, um, advertising mails from Amazon each day? that offers me a discount of 15 to 20% if I pay in Bitcoin. Why would a big tech be so uh, active in promoting Bitcoin? We have to uh, start uh, realizing what is, what is behind that and be more proactive instead of well, just uh, um, monitoring or uh, when you said observatory uh, on blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> that was not the, right, the term that, that I wanted to hear. I want to hear engagement and, and experiment. Um, well, I'm talking too long yeah, again, sorry. <laughs> how do we manage to wake up Europe in that sense? Because you talk about speed, but there's a urgency. Um, it's very clear most of us here have it, but how do we wake up Europe in terms of the parliament and the legislation we need 
to at least do the first thing, which is become cloud ready. Everything you mentioned needs to be, you need to be cloud ready. And to be cloud ready means you need to be able to have all your software, all your systems working on the cloud. Today, the, cl the cloud discussion in, in Europe is an intellectual discussion that's very little to do with the reality. We're discussing where, how should we manage electric cars? Should we plug the car publicly in the house? If we are driving diesel cars, nobody has an electric car. I can put a plug mm -hmm. in every corner, nobody has one. There are some Teslas in Amsterdam running around for taxis. But yeah. So <laughs> uh, most uh, banks have their legacy software that does not run. So um, what we need to do is to make sure that banks become cloud ready really fast. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're gonna, lose, we're gonna lose the train. And that's, yeah. uh, that's what we need uh, the EU to understand that it's mandatory, that's fast, and we should go do it. But we need the EU to wake up to that. Well, I think and I hope that in the consultation uh, that we have heard just a little bit about, uh, I hope that many of you uh, have uh, sent in very concrete uh, uh, reactions so that the Commission exactly knows where uh, the, the pitfalls and where the problems are. And, and of course, I'm sure uh, um, a lot of them will have to do with the legal uncertainty that is still mm -hmm. uh, uh, around on, on the cloud. What are you allowed to do in the cloud? Who is liable? Uh, uh, all these issues, they have to be solved. And um, that's why um, I also um, mentioned many times uh, to the Commission that uh, they really um, have to put forward an action plan with a focus on action and also the focus on plan, which means actual timetables, uh, when will we achieve uh, all these goals. And of course, uh, they will do that. Huh? <laughs> I hope so. But uh, uh, in the meantime, debates like this, and, and uh, I think all of you in, in your, uh, well, you all, you all have your own um, internal media and, and external uh, public affairs and, and uh, PR uh, machineries, so uh, let them send the message as well. Um, and of course we have the people from, uh, from the press here, they can uh, also help. <laughs> Any other reaction on what it was said in the panel? Do you want to say something before I open the floor to questions? I can make uh, up to you. <laughs> I have something to add um, because uh, as a fintech now, uh, we want to expand in different countries in Europe. And um, I think it's difficult to understand the difficulty to, op to, 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 to be present in different countries for a fintech. Uh, it's actually, it's like open, opening a new company in every single uh, country because despite the rules are sometimes on, on a European level, a level uh, the reality is different because the interpretation of uh, local countries are different. And so what is allowed in Belgium, maybe it's not allowed in France or it's differently allowed in Germany. So it's very complex. We have to, if, if we compare with American companies, we have to face different languages. We have to face sometimes different currencies because not all European countries are in, uh, are in Euro. And we have to face the interpretation of uh, the regulations differently from one country uh, to another. And so it's, uh, it's very expensive, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy, and when you, when you see the fintechs in Europe, a lot of them are national only. They are not uh, in different countries. And I think Europe has a role to play uh, to make our life easier. And this is also related to the scale up. That Cora, you, uh, you mentioned. Um, what can we do about that? Exactly on that, I mean, I can only fully agree. And I mentioned the European level, um, level regulatory sandbox, which was a question, which basically would be passporting. You have the question on the crowdfunding, which also goes in the direction of passporting going everywhere. Quick comment on, on the US, as some of our unicorns that we do have in Europe say, you do need 50 different payment licenses there. You do need 50 different insurance licenses. You can get them fairly easily. But in some of the sectors, it, it is worse. On the very welcome encouragement from the parliament to move faster and to engage more, um, I can mention that, I mean, actually, we have, I think, four running projects on blockchain going right now in various sectors. So I mean, they're running now, which means they were already foreseen two to three 
three years ago, so there is a bit more engagement. We welcome us to be pushed to, to do more. And I can say with the observatory, I mean, French is one of the languages we work in, so it's a little bit coming from observatoire. But the idea is to, to engage more and to engage on, on specific sectors. And again, we welcome the collaboration of the parliament as well as the private sector. And if we take the example of the FC, where the area is now available um, as one of the eligible sectors, I mean, this would definitely always be in a public-private uh, collaboration. So uh, we have a lot to do and to do together. Thank you. And with this uh, statement, let's open the floor to quest for questions. I see one hand there. Second question here. We'll collect two, three questions, and then uh, we can I have answer. already two, sorry. Uh, Jorge Valero from uh, Your Active. Uh, first question, I will be for uh, Ezequiel. Uh, I mean, in the financial service uh, part, we have already um, an international approach when it comes to macroprudential rules, uh, capital buffers, and so forth. I mean, the Basel III or Basel IV now uh, uh, system. So how would you see uh, the fintech world uh, at the international stage from a regulatory point of view? I mean, will there be like a subcategory within Basel to deal with it or something else will be created? Uh, I don't know if you could give us some comment on this because at the end of the day, I mean, technology and financial services are global, so you will need also a, a global approach to this. Um, for the, uh, let's say, the EU institution side, uh, Cora, you said, uh, I mean, the need for speed, but uh, I mean, this is obviously something that you need in fintech, uh, where everything evolves so fast. But I mean, also, I mean, the, in Europe, we have 28, well, 27 member states very soon. And we have different sensitivities when it comes to privacy, especially in Germany, um, so on and so forth. And uh, for example, the first time I, I heard about uh, sandboxes was in, in Davos. Not this year, but last year. So it's been already one year and a half, and now the commission is working on an action plan, which might come at the end of the year. It will take another year to implement that. So to what extent it's it's feasible and possible to be agile and, and come up with something quite fast in Europe? Thank you. Let's go to Gudram. Guntram Wolf of Prügel. Uh, I also have a question to the public sector representatives, so European Parliament, European Commission. You both mentioned the issue of same service, same rules. And uh, this is, of course, a recurring theme in the whole digital revolution and the transformation of uh, traditional industry coming from new disruptors in the digital, digital sector, be it Airbnb or be it, be, it, be it others. Now, I guess my question to you is, how do you want to concretely go about this? Because regulation, there's basically regulation upward and regulation downward, right? So you can regulate the financial, uh, the fintech sector upwards to the same level of banks and, and other institutions, or you can get rid of um, uh, some of the regulations in the in the banking system. And so, so I guess you have to strike the right balance between the two and find out which regulations are essential to keep and which are not essential and basically slack. If, if you think about the taxi business, Uber, I mean, certainly there's a lot of good regulations in taxis, but there's also a lot of uh, basically protectionist regulation that just uh, help to monopolize, uh, monopolize rents. Um, so, so you have to strike a very careful balance between the two. And I would like to hear, especially perhaps from the Commission, how you want to strike the balance uh, there and how do you want to concretely get about this, this very big challenge, same service, same regulation? Uh, let's have a first round of answers and then we'll see. So uh, let's start to with uh, the first question to you, Ezekiel. So uh, I think, honestly, the... Um, the, I mean, fintech is a word that I, I struggle to understand with a very uh, wide definition on what's a fintech, right? That's why I, I really believe that we should focus on the what and not the, and not the who's doing it. Uh, and then when you do that, you move from talking fintech to talking activity, then the answer, if it's uh, within certain banking regulations and some capital requirements or not, becomes obvious, right? So um, the, uh, the requirements on a company that does aggregation of uh, accounts to show you the information and do analytics, 
that they, the only capital I want them to have is to make sure that they don't go out of business in the next 24 months, that they have the right investment on uh, cyber uh, security, that they obey all the laws. That, so um, I think that um, we, we do need regulation, but it needs to be regulation that uh, it's, a, it's not, a, um, let's say, becoming a, a barrier. And that regulation will be great for anybody that wants to do it. The problem there is, is that what if there is a company that does that? And this has to do with, I think, your point when you say, Cora, that there was no enough uh, money flow to uh, venture capitals. Venture capitals are very simple, straightforward. People, they, they want to uh, put money and get an exit. And the difference between them and private equity is that they are very ready to take a very high risk to high return. So it's great for an economy to have a lot of guys ready to play poker with the money. And if it goes well, it's good for the economy because it's, it's making it very dynamic. So I love venture capitals in that sense. I, I admire them because they, they, they have guts. They invest on 10 companies knowing that only one is going to go well. Very impressive. Um, but the thing is, they want to have an exit. And if, they, uh, in, if you are investing in, in developing uh, drugs for, uh, for medicine, and you know that no pharmaceutical company can buy it, you would put no money there. So if you are a, a venture capital and you want to decide to invest on fintech, and ING uh, or, 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 a, or, or Rabobank or BBVA or something cannot buy you, you will not do it. So the problem for me to buy them, being Santander, is that uh, the moment they are regulated different, right? They are aggregating, they have no capital requirements. The moment I buy them and I put them under the bank, we consolidate, boom, they have all these regulations. And I want to update the software, I cannot, it's consuming capital. So you may want to do something, learn from the past, knowing that you don't want banks to play with the money from the depot. So what do you do? You put a ring fence, and that's it. And then it becomes a proper investment. If it goes bad, goes bad. If it goes well, goes well. So I think that um, it's very important to be able to allow uh, the banking sector to actively participate in, a, in the fintechs, be investors for you, be, be customers, be uh, buyers, without uh, getting into this uh, capital discussion. And that you will need to do some kind of ring fencing. That's what I think. Uh, with that, and uh, the Americans have a nice expression that they are born uh, as entrepreneurs because uh, even when they are still in the womb, they are already thinking about their exit strategy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think we need a bit more of that uh, uh, as well. And uh, on, on your question on the speed, well, I tried my best, uh, and I think I saved us uh, at, at least a year because normally the parliament waits uh, the, for the first proposal uh, from the Commission, uh, and now we were there before. Uh, we already had uh, uh, a report uh, with a big mandate from the Parliament with a lot of general principles and a long list of uh, recommendations. So uh, I think we saved some time there so that the Commission can now, uh, I can only repeat it, can come forward with a real action plan uh, already because they, they know what the position of Parliament is on a lot of uh, the issues. And I think in future, what also could help if we um, move away from the rule-based ticking the box kind of legislation to a more principle-based and a more, well, like I said, more technology neutral and more focused on the activities and not so much on the legal entities. Uh, and in a way, uh, uh, the Payment Services Directive is a good example because it is about payments. It's not just about banks or... Uh, um, uh, so I think the Commission should uh, uh, keep up the work uh, uh, like that and, and focus on, on the activities. I actually didn't say same service, same rules, but uh, I, I do agree with the spirit. But what I won't comment on is the application of MIFID PSD2, which is, I mean, my colleague, colleagues in FISMA. But from the digital single market side, where I very much do agree with the spirit, is I think we are going towards, whether you take it from the consumer's point of view, digital making things holistic and consumer-centered. I mean, you don't have the silos you can move across easily. And you have a convergence of the technologies going on. As I said, I'm about to go off and speak and say completely different things about, about IoT. But it is clear that the IoT ecosystem will depend on a fintech component for payments, for micropayments, which can often be machine to machine. So we'll have the issues of data access to data, including machine-generated data. This is our free flow of data initiative. So also access by the banks to other data that's machine-generated, as well as access to, for instance, uh, market data to the big players who were mentioned. 
In the area of data, I mean, it's been mentioned by the uh, European Data Protection Supervisor, for instance, in a debate on FinTech that I was at in one of the other fine think tanks in this town, that there could be very much a place for a code of conduct on data in financial services or FinTech where you can really bring all the players under one roof. If you can get them there, it's industry driven and it would be the commission and the Article 29 working party that works with you and adopts it. So this kind of, how to say, level playing field or same regulations, same rules, it is clear as we move to the data economy, as we move to the Internet of Things powered by payments, micropayments, exchange of value, as blockchain increases possibilities to validate transactions outside of our certain ecosystem that we have right now, it is going to be needed to bring the sectors together across the silos, which was why I also mentioned, I mean, maybe not good to, to single out a member state, but in addition to the sandbox, which is in the FCA, the Netherlands, Lithuania, maybe Sweden soon, um, this article of the French Constitution is interesting that it goes across sectors. And more and more, I think, and we see it now, for instance, with the ISO 307, the technical uh, committee on uh, blockchain at the world level, I mean, this is going to go across all the sectors. So when we'll come to the discussion of data, which probably won't be so uh, detailed at this world level, but when we bring it back down to the application of the GDPR, et cetera, I mean, we're going to have to say, okay, then here's health data, here's financial data, here's machine-generated data, which isn't personal data, but then it might be addressed by a new instrument. And this will be a challenge, and I think the spirit is, is the same one. And then, as is the spirit of the task force, we work across silos. So also, when the colleagues are looking at the purely financial legislation, I mean, we'll do that in conjunction because the new technologies are changing and will change, and we want to take the advantage of the change the way that also this financial sector works. I think just what, one comment on what Cora said about uh, trying to switch as we start writing now a new legislation from a, from a prescript to, to a principle, uh, I think it's, it's not an option. It's, it's the only way we have because there's, there's no way we write things in a prescriptive way today and it doesn't become obsolete in the next quarter. And I, 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 I live on this, I work on this, and I wouldn't be able to write something that stands for the next five months, uh, the way uh, APIs work, the way everything works. So I think we need to, uh, we need to follow the Americans in this one and be more a, a less prescriptive and more, uh, more by principle. Otherwise, we, will, we would not be able to write something that is it's, uh, it's relevant next year. We need to write a lot every time. Uh, yeah, one question here, Antonio. It is more um, a comment than a question uh, related to the, the what with, I think that everybody agrees with, same activities, same regulation. I think that is needed to add as well the same supervision because because it is part of the same equation. Uh, um, regulation um, can be arbitrage, or some players could try to arbitrage regulation. But a good supervision is very difficult to arbitrage. Because of proportionality, we couldn't really put that law to them. So um, I want, as a customer, I want my money and my data to be treated properly by every bloody company. I don't care who they are, what they do, and, and that's as simple as that. And, and I do care where the company is from, because when the company is part of the EU, I know that they have to obey these rules. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm happy to put my data to an app that is within the EU and not an app that is in China, for example. So I think the, the, we, have a, we have something to do there. Thanks, Antonio, for that comment. <laughs> Even from the same bank. <laughs> Any other uh, comment, question? Okay, okay hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for your invitation and for this nice discussion. My name is Delia Mano. I'm working for Direct Computer Resources, a small company based in the States, providing with software having to do with protection of data. On behalf of DCR, I joined since a couple of years in, here in Brussels, mostly a lot of presentations, events having to do with the European Commission, ENISA, 
mostly focusing on cybersecurity. We are very involved in the states because we are board member in the state with Internet Security Alliance. So they are very deep involved with cybersecurity and with very proactive and concrete actions. Now, this is the first thing to do. My, okay. Now, it's a personal question because have nothing to do with this year, have to do with me. Right now, I'm just in this, I'm just talking with you like a simple citizen. I'm a Dutch citizen living in Belgium, working for an American company. I asked for a divorce, and since seven years, I'm fighting like crazy. And then right now, I have discovered my phone, my cell is hacked, but in a very terrible way. I'm doing all the necessary and get involved with all the persons and connections on LinkedIn. I know persons high level position with the European Commission, like Andrea Servida, people for cybersecurity, people who gave wonderful presentations of GDPR and stuff. Nobody can help me and, you know, for God's sake, help me to stop this. My ex just followed me and want and just said that he want to kill my kids and myself. I just go to Ombudsman Telecommunication in Belgium. I just speak with authorities in the Netherlands. They tell me they cannot help me because I'm a Dutch citizen, but the divorce was pronounced on the Belgium territory and we don't have any rules and anything in common, even we have regulations, you know, within the European Commission to help you so far. What I'm supposed to do? Give me an answer. This is a simple citizen, Change but I'm deep involved in cybersecurity Change matters and so on. What do you think about that? So if you go very up, you know, upstairs, even if you are speaking with Viviane Redding, with whoever you want, nobody can give you with Thank a you. concrete answer. You know what I mean? And the phone is hacked and I see it every single day and they'll eventually make some researches. They suggested me eventually to go to Europol, but then you need to see how to proceed, you know, so far. So this is my question. Thank you. Um, any other uh, probably more general question? <laughs> yes, there is a question there. Thank you. Quick question. Uh, Christoph Bond from the Swiss Finance Council. Uh, we s we've spent the whole uh, spring uh, responding to the consultation, and you may spend the uh, summer reading the, uh, the responses, and I think some of them are quite concrete, so I hope you won't. Uh, quick question. I mean, you mentioned the action plan. When, should, when should, should we expect an action plan, if there will be an action plan? What is the future of the task force next year? Or after an action plan will be uh, will be published because I understand this is not a permanent body. And second question is: digital is global by by nature, um, but the EU, of course, has a tendency which is which is normal to focus on the single market, preserving the single market. But we need to look beyond. Uh, there needs to be an alignment on the um, on what's happening at global level. Uh, we need interoperability, portability. Uh, E-identification is only one uh, very concrete example. I understand banks are waiting for concrete uh, solutions. You mentioned ISO. Can you say can you say a little bit more on your involvement in international agenda uh, setting organizations like well ISO, but there might be more uh, about developing standards and what the Commission is doing or plans to do. Thank you. Is there a, any other question before we go back to the panel? I don't see any hand, so yes, please. Yes, because I know you will take some questions. So one, only one comment on, on, on the first, on the, on the phone hacked, if I may say, which is just a, a sorry to bring it to our own issue discussion on your personal thing, which is um, I think there is a little awareness uh, within uh, government institutions and, and public on on how easy it is to uh, hack and, and, and get information. I I think uh, the wanna cry was the first time people realized that uh, nobody's safe and how easy it is. Uh, that people realized that um, a cryptocurrency is very romantic, but uh, it, it can also be used for um, for illegal activities besides paying coffee. We like every cash is this is new and and um, and I think that um, we should go as fast as possible, really fast, because it's the competitive of the EU is, is in, at stake, but um, uh, we should be very careful when we talk about uh, a, a access to information, exchange information, like scrapping and, and allowing a, a different companies to have some certain information because we are talking about uh, privacy of people. And it's very, if you don't have the proper um, teams and infrastructure to look after the information, um, it's not difficult to hack a phone or something. So. It's, uh, 
the, it's a big issue, and, and now there were companies hacked, but uh, it, there could be a wanna cry at, at a personal computer level anytime. And then you would have a lot of voters and citizens really upset. So I think there is an issue on privacy that uh, we should take care of, and, and uh, banks have spent l billions on looking after data for, for many years and, and trying that uh, these things don't happen because uh, uh, that activity of, of whoever hacked your phone is a criminal activity, by the way. And there's criminal activity also hacking in bank accounts. So we should be very careful. We're talking about criminal activity. There's nothing romantic about anybody hacking somebody else's phone. It's just criminal. That goes, of course, beyond national borders and requires broad uh, collaboration. Correct, correct. That, that's why I think uh, we should go fast, but we should be take, take it into account. That yeah. it's, we are dealing with, uh, with, with uh, the information, and it's a... Uh, and it's what crooks need, need to, to do. Yeah. Yes. Also in my report, uh, cybersecurity was uh, priority number one. And because what happened to you, it, it, it happens uh, to a lot of people, uh, and it's very, uh, very unfortunate. Uh, in today, in, in the Dutch uh, uh, newspapers, there was uh, also an, an um, attempt to create more awareness. Uh, they were uh, mentioning the have I been pwned, uh, uh, com initiative. You can just add your email address and find out whether you are hacked or not. Uh, it's, 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 it's try it out. It's, you, it shows immediately. Um, but I, I think we need more cooperation, more collaboration on, uh, on these issues on, on a global uh, level. Um, and, and the second part is, is the awareness that there is no such thing as 100% security. So uh, what we need to do, especially uh, for SMEs, uh, to make sure that uh, if you are hacked, that you at least have a contingency plan in place uh, so that you know uh, what you can do to, to control uh, the damage, um, uh, because that is the least uh, you should do. And, and well, to, to my knowledge, most of, uh, most of SMEs are, are not really thinking about their contingency plan. So that's also a recommendation to, to ask for that at least. So people know uh, where the weaknesses are and are prepared to act uh, once they are hacked. But in terms of individual citizens, uh, that also signals that probably we need to spend some more time uh, and effort for the awareness of these risks and how what are the steps uh, to move forward with that? Please, Petris. No, I'd uh, say, of course, answering also the, the first question and then very punctually the, the second one because I have to get up to this other panel. But the first question, I mean, I'm probably at the, the limits of my competence here, but I mean, I think there's a, a CERT, uh, Computer Emergency uh, Reaction Team. I'm not sure if they handle individual cases, I mean, on our company level, banking level, but I mean, there is one for, for Belgium. And then moving to the, the second question, first of all, yes, we're going to analyze the questions. We're not going to take all summer. We're aiming to do it in eight days. And that's the aim right now. We have mobilized a lot of people, and this could be a lot of hours. Then the way, I mean, I possibly don't need to explain that in this room, but the way that the commission works, we are a political organization. So we submit the analysis to our hierarchy. There will be a political decision between Vice President Ambroskis, if Vice President Ansip is uh, participating as well, others, whether it will be called an action plan, there will be action, and I think there will be a plan. Um, what it come, what it is, and exactly which actions go in, I decided politically. I mean, you can read from the questions in the public consultation the ideas that we have. I mean, they're they're quite obviously there. There's more that you can do in one initiative. So the most priority ones will be chosen. Uh, the fintech task force. It's it's great. It's a uh, wonderful group of, of people across the silos, but uh, unfortunately it's not a so-called organogram post that stays for me as well. It's intended basically to do this work, and it's also a model for some other areas that the commission is going to bring together a number of DGs like that. We had to prepare the public consultation, publish it, analyze it, the thing that comes out of it, which is yet to be unnamed, and then probably the implementation then will be different groups of people, different units, and probably as such, it won't exist for more than a, a year more. But then you could imagine specific ones like 
and I'm just throwing out an idea, no promise here, cross-sectoral one on blockchain, working with the observatory, et cetera, other issues, issues of data use in various sectors, including uh, the financial sector and other parts of the, of the data economy and how the rules need to be worked on. So it's a little bit of an innovative approach in our own way of working, and also intended to do something and then stop, and then we form the next unit, or I shouldn't be worried use unit because it's in the organogram, but the next body that carries the work further. Thank you. Uh, and with this, uh, we reach the end. Uh, please uh, join me to thank uh, the speakers uh, for being here today. And thank you. Have a nice